Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here and welcome back for this session, Russian Information Warfare, the Battle to Control Reality. We have the distinct privilege of having Dr. Biljana Lilly here with us, and I think you will all find great value in what she has to say. My name is Cadet Grayson Marola. I'm a criminal justice major, also studying information warfare, and hoping to commission into the Army as an intelligence officer. I'm now going to pass it off to my fellow moderator to introduce herself, as well as a little bit about Dr. Lilly. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jenna Jones. I'm a computer science junior here at Norwich University. And I have the honor of introducing Dr. Lilly. Dr. Biliana Lilly is a cybersecurity and foreign policy leader with over 20 years of managerial, technical, and research experience. She is the chair of the Democratic Resilience Track of the Warsaw Security Forum, an advisor to the venture capital firm Night Dragon, and an adjunct researcher at the RAND Corporation. Dr. Lilly is a mentor and speaker at DEF CON, SciCon, and the Executive Women's Forum. She has worked at the United Nations in Deloitte Financial Cyber Advisory and has advised the Pentagon, the White House, and NATO, among others. She has a PhD and three master's degrees, including a degree from Oxford University with distinction. Dr. Lilly has published two books. Her second book, titled Russian Information Warfare, Assault on Democracies in the Cyber Wild West, became an Amazon bestseller. She has been denounced by Russia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and called a cyber expert by Tom Hanks. I will now pass it over to Dr. Lilly. Thank you, Grayson and Jenna, for this great introduction. I'm really glad to be here. Hi, everyone. And I'm honored to address you all on the 30th anniversary of the Military Writers Symposium. And it's my first time on campus, and I'm really impressed with what I'm seeing, with the passion you have to resolve hard issues, with the intelligence that I see in all the individuals I've met. So kudos to you, and um, I think you've made a great choice with this school. I will focus in my talk today on Russian information warfare. And the topic couldn't be more relevant for this year's theme of the symposium because through information warfare, the Russian government attempts not to control territory or resources, but to control our reality and our minds. But also, I'll talk a lot today about disinformation and strategic messaging and what Russia's playbook is. And one main takeaway I hope that you leave this room with today from my presentation is that disinformation and propaganda, any sort of strategic messaging that the Russian government employs is never conducted in a strategic vacuum. There is always a doctrine and an objective. And if we focus on that doctrine and that objective, it is much easier to identify disinformation and design effective policies to mitigate it. So with that in mind, the three main parts of my presentation to today will be, first, I'll talk to you a little bit about what is Russian information warfare. And we heard several definitions today. My definition will be directly from Russian military doctrine. And I think this is critical because if we want to understand how our adversary thinks and employs different strategies and different tactics, we have to learn what their definition of that particular strategy is. Then we will look at how the Russian government has operationalized information warfare in Ukraine, and we'll talk about the different aspects and activities that fall under information warfare. After that, we'll look at how the Russian government has recently employed information warfare across different European states and the United States. I want to say one caveat here. Information warfare is not new. During the Cold War, the Russian government has been developing and refining con the, that concept in different activities that fall under this umbrella of information warfare. But I will focus on the most recent examples because they're in our lifetime and because they can also tell us what to expect going forward. And at the end, we'll finish with a few suggestions on how we can mitigate and defend against the types of operations that the Russian government is employing. And afterwards, I look forward to your questions. So first, what is information warfare? The Russian government published a document. Uh, it's specifically called Concept on Activities in the Information Space already in 2011. 
And in that document, the Russian government provided a very succinct definition of information warfare. And the term is called information confrontation or information war by different scholars. I use information warfare because that's the term that is most prevalent in the military literature that I have read and in this particular document. So according to this document, information warfare is confrontation between two or more states in the information space. That's it. That's all the document says. And information space is the equivalent of cyberspace to the Russians. But then what I found really interesting is the objectives that information warfare is used for. And they're also listed in that document. And I think they're very telling about this particular doctrine because the objectives are four, and I've listed them here. Let's look at them. The first one is to damage information systems. The second is to undermine political, economic, and social systems. The third is to conduct massive psychological manipulation of the population to destabilize the stance in society. And the final one is to coerce the state to take decisions for the benefit of the opposing force, which in this case is Russia. So if we look at those four objectives of information warfare, what can we see in them? And this is literally taken word by word from the Russian concept on information, the information space. We can see that only the first objective has disruptive technical effects. The second, third, and fourth, they all aim at exerting psychological effects on a targeted country. And that's very important here because it shows you that in Russia's playbook, disinformation and propaganda, which are a part of strategic messaging, go hand in hand with cyber operations. They're in the same playbook, in the same doctrine. So when we look at how is Russia operationalizing or conducting information warfare to achieve these four objectives, there are two core components. The first is cyber operations to achieve the information systems damage. That is the number, that number one objective. But the other types of operations or activities that the Russian government employs are strategic messaging campaigns that include disinformation and propaganda. And they primarily aim to achieve the second, third, and fourth objective, which are the majority of objectives of information warfare. And we already heard several definitions of propaganda and disinformation. The important element between that distinguishes those two that I think we should remember is that disinformation contains, it's deliberate and it contains fake information. While propaganda can typically be a one-sided representation of a story or one-sided representation of an event or an opinion, it doesn't necessarily have to contain, contain fake information, but disinformation does. And I use the term strategic messaging to, to encompass both of those because the Russian government sometimes, as we heard earlier, uses fake narratives in its stories, but sometimes it just presents one side of the story. And so both of them are incorporated this, in this one term called strategic messaging. So what about other activities? As I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, disinformation is never conducted solely in a vacuum. It has strategic intent, but it also, there are usually other related activities that are conducted around particular strategic messaging campaigns, cyber operations, that also the Russian government has supported. During peace, in a lot of cases, strategic messaging campaigns and cyber operations go hand in hand with protests. And we have heard about a number of protests that the Russian government has sponsored from Estonia, Germany, France to the United States. And we have, I'll show you some of those examples. The Russian government also very deliberately introduces sanctions against countries that it has um, a, a confrontational relationship with, even for a particular event. The Russian government has also been behind assassinations and attempted assassinations. For example, in 2018, when Montenegro just um, just decided, the country decided to join NATO, voted for a pro-NATO leader, the Russian government was behind an attempted assassination of the newly elected prime minister of Montenegro. It was, that was almost successful. And I'm happy to talk about that with you if anyone has questions. Explosions have been a part of Russia's subversive playbook for over a decade. In Bulgaria, in the Czech Republic, now in Germany, in Poland, we see this across the board. During war, information warfare is still very actively conducted by a variety of Russian actors, but also it is combined with kinetic military operations. And I will show you how it's specifically done in the case of Ukraine. With regards to agents, we already heard from a number of our speakers 
that the stakeholders that are participating in Russia's information warfare campaigns are rather diverse. But we could still group them because it presents us with an idea of um, how diverse the network is and how vast it is. So first you have government agents. You have actual, the Russian president of course is one of the biggest um, agents of disinformation and information warfare within Russia. But then you have Russian embassies, you have um, military officials as well as military um, agencies such as the GRU, military intelligence, that has some of the best hacking groups that are collecting information and also being engaged in propaganda efforts and disinformation efforts. Then you have non-state actors. Specifically in Russia, you may have heard about ransomware attacks being launched by Russian criminal groups or Russian hackers. Most of those hackers, if not all of them, are working still with the support of the Russian government. There are a number of narratives, a great book by um, an investigator, a journalist, in, journalistic investigator who actually wrote about this and he went and spoke to some of those hackers. Even hackers who are not necessarily on the government payroll have to coordinate their operations with the Russian government from Russia. You also have local assets. And I'll show you a few of the more recent examples in Europe. The Russian government is actively sponsoring politicians in different European countries and activists in different European countries, including in the US, to, pro to protest on behalf of the Russian government, to influence elections in line with Russia's interests. And all of this is happening in our time. So when we talk about strategic messaging, strategic, Russia's strategic messaging and controlling reality, as I mentioned earlier, the narratives are thousands. And we, I will show you some of the disinformation campaigns that have been spread in Ukraine. But when we think about them, it's very important to understand Russia's intention and the audiences of these messages. And they're primarily four. If we look at the globe, we can see the differentiation between four audiences. First, domestically within Russia. The main objective of Russia's strategic messaging today is to ensure that the Russian people continue to support Russia's war in Ukraine. In Ukraine, the message, all the strategic messaging campaigns by the Russian government aim to ensure that they, they aim to destabilize the Ukrainian government and ensure that they can break the will of the population to fight. And actually, this information has been, I would say, generally successful in certain areas of doing that. Europe and the US. In our specific countries, the main aim of Russian disinformation today is to erode the support of our own government and our own population for the war in Ukraine. And in the global south, which includes Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the Russian government has become pretty successful in using the war in Ukraine, in using US foreign policy to um, move our allies and other countries that are not typically aligned with the United States even further away from, um, from partnering with us, through sowing distrust, through showing Russian propaganda. And we can clearly see that in Brazil and a few other countries where Russian media is, has become very popular and the viewership there has skyrocketed. So when we talk about Russian information warfare in Ukraine, what have we seen so far? I've looked first here at, um, I'd like to show you first the cyber dim dimension of information warfare. If you remember, there are two components, the disruptive technical one and the psychological one, which are conducted through cyber operations and strategic messaging. So we'll tackle first cyber operations. First, I want to mention that here I only look at the four stages of cyber warfare so far since the kinetic invasion in February of 2022, but the war has been ongoing since 2014, since the annexation of Crimea. And it's very important to remember that continuity, that it didn't start just in 2022. But around that period, we had first cyber operations that primarily aimed at conducting reconnaissance and propositioning malware on Ukrainian critical infrastructure. There were a number of APT groups that were very active before the actual invasion. And by APT, I mean advanced persistent threat actors. Those are basically sophisticated hackers that um, use advanced malware and are professionally trained to conduct cyber operations. So there were quite a lot of those groups specifically focused on the Ukrainian theater of operations. 
There were also website defacements and DDoS attacks, and those are more disruptive. What's a website defacement? A hacker will hack into a website and put a funny picture or disable some of the functionality of the website. It's not necessarily disruptive to military operations, but it could be a nuisance, and it's showing that the enemy, the enemy has a reach into that environment. DDoS attacks can be potentially more disruptive. Those are denial, uh, distributed denial of service attacks which aim at sending a lot of requests to a website and then the website or the system starts up, stops working because it's overwhelmed. And we had an overwhelming um, number of DDoS attacks against Ukrainian critical infrastructure just around the actual invasion in February 2022. And they were also disruptive cyber operations against satellite communications and telecommunications providers in Ukraine, which aims to disrupt the command and control functions of the Ukrainian military during the initial invasion. Since that period, the Russian government has slightly shifted its cyber operations to more disruptive attacks and also to espionage campaigns. We had also a number of DDoS attacks against critical infrastructure, specifically the energy sector, the telecommunications sector, and the government networks. And then since, since early 2023, one could argue that we have noticed the evolution of cyber operations in Ukraine, where now the hackers are collaborating more with the military ground forces and hackers have even deployed close to the battlefield because they're training the ground forces into how to capture phones, mobile phones of soldiers that they have captured and they then break into the phones, collect information that has been um, communicated through encrypted channels from those phones and use them to identify targets um, such as soldiers and um, actual equipment on the battlefield and then use that to conduct further strikes. So we see that that convergence of cyber activities with actual kinetic military operations. So, so that's on the cyber front. What about the strategic messaging front, which is more of the focus of our conference today? Well, there have been a number of different fake narratives since the beginning of the war, and I've listed here just a few of them friction between Zelensky and his military commanders, discrediting Olena Zelenska, who's President Zelensky's wife. Um, there has been a lot of information about U.S. biolabs in Ukraine, and we had General Potter give you a very good overview of the history, historical background specifically of that fake narrative. So it doesn't come out of the blue, and it wasn't just proliferated during this period. It has existed for, for years before that. There has also been a lot of propaganda and disinformation about the origins of the war and one particular narrative that unfortunately has picked up quite uh, prolifically in Russia but also in some parts of Ukraine is that NATO and the CIA have been behind the war and prompted the war. So these are just some of the narratives. When I speak to our Ukrainian colleagues, they tell me that they are identifying hundreds of narratives of different disinformation pieces per day in different regions of Ukraine. So it's really, it's impossible to counter them all and, and count them all. But what is important here is, is also to see the strategic intent. All of these narratives aim to intimidate and disrupt the Ukrainian population and the Ukrainian government and break their will to fight so that Russia can have advantage on the battlefield. And there have also been, um, what's really interesting in this particular case that also shows intent is that typically, even before the war, we saw that disinformation infrastructure or strategic messaging infrastructure almost can serve as a precursor or an early warning indicator for the war, similar to how we saw cyber operations in advance of the actual invasion, we saw infrastructure that would disseminate strategic messaging campaigns being prepared in advance of the actual invasion. And we saw very similar steps taken before the Russians will occupy a certain city. They will go on Telegram and create fake accounts of local newspapers and media channels and then start spreading the Russian position through them. Then take over the city and when the troops leave, then the strategic messaging, the volume of strategic messaging will also decrease. So you see disinformation and propaganda going hand in hand with military operations in this way. So what about combined tactics? We've often seen, specifically in the case of Ukraine, how cyber operations and strategic messaging, in this case pure disinformation, go hand in hand, which, is, which shows you the combination of information warfare and its oper operationalization on the ground. For example, Facebook accounts 
of military commanders, of Ukrainian military commanders were hacked. And then through them, information was sent to the soldiers saying that they should surrender, as if the message is coming from their commanders, while in fact it was coming from the Russians. In another case, two radio stations in a city were hacked, and a message that Zelensky was hospitalized was spread through, through the airwaves, and some people heard it. So this is how the Russians are combining those two tactics, trying to control reality in Ukraine. So what have we seen in Europe? Quite a lot. And I'd say I've been studying information warfare since 2016. And before that, for about 10 to 15 years, I've been studying Russian military, the Russian military mindset. And before the war in Ukraine, the Russian government was a lot more subtle and cautious in its operations against the West. Usually, in its own backyard, in its own domestic affairs, the Russians are a lot more aggressive. But they weren't as aggressive towards Germany, towards the UK, towards France, and towards the US until the war, and especially in the last year, year and a half. But since we've introduced sanctions, we've reduced our energy dependence on Russia, Russia has shifted its major partners, um, trade partners, more to India, China, and other countries, we've also noticed that the Russians have become a lot more aggressive in our own neighborhood, unfortunately. So these are just some of the types of operations that we have been seeing across Europe over the past two years. And they're quite alarming. First, there have been a number of disruptive cyber attacks that are linked to Russian hackers against European targets, and they significantly increased in the first quarter of 2024 in comparison to the previous year. We also have noticed an increase in ransomware attacks, specifically against hospitals, against schools, and against the financial sector. And you could say the, fina the financial sector can handle it. They can pay a couple of million dollars to decrypt certain encrypted communication. But think about what this does to a hospital. When you have, when emergency, um, doctors in the emergency rooms cannot access the patient's record and cannot perform life-saving operations then you actually have the direct link between ransomware attacks and actual lethal effects of those attacks. And we've seen that in a number of cases. So this is pretty, pretty disturbing. With regards to strategic messaging, the Russians have significantly increased the volume of strategic messaging across Europe from a number of different sources. And Nina mentioned the doppelganger uh, campaign. I'll talk a little bit about it or mention it on the next slide. But we have significant proliferation of fake websites that, that uh, propagate Russian state-sponsored messaging through a number of sources. You have them through social media, you have them through um, internet and also traditional media channels. You also have very disturbing cases of actual um, money being given to politicians, European politicians in the Netherlands, in Germany, in the UK, from the Russian government in order to um, to support Russia's position in their respective governments and even to influence your, the EU elections this year. And one particular campaign that I'll all encourage you to Google is the Voice of Europe campaign, where um, a website in the Czech Republic in the Prague that was supposed to be more neutral, not aligned with the Russian government, was giving voice to um, right-wing politicians across Europe, but it turned out that the person behind that website was a Ukrainian oligarch who is very close to President Putin, and that oligarch was also giving money to different politicians across Europe to ensure that they align their governments with Russia's position. So that's an actual case but that, has, that was disclosed in March of this year, and we continue to receive information about the politicians that have, been, that have received funding specifically or sponsorship from Russia specifically for this, this campaign. We also have good old-fashioned sabotage. In the case of Poland, we have Russians behind derailing aid convoys that go to Ukraine. And remember, the main objective of the Russian government right now is to win the war in Ukraine. That is why a lot of its operations are focused on eroding our support for Ukraine, by that I mean Western support for Ukraine, or breaking the will of the Ukrainian people to fight. And we see that in Russia's operations in Poland. In the UK, there was a Ukrainian business that was almost set on fire, again, for Russian sabotage. And again, a number of fake protests just over the past year in Paris, Brussels, The Hague, and other places, all from the Russian government. So this shows us all that the Russian playbook is quite diverse. And from all I've studied, I have two hypotheses of why we're seeing so much of this lately. First is either we really didn't pay attention to Russia's activities earlier, and now we're discovering them all at once because now we care. 
or the Russian government has really become more aggressive against the, US, the, the Western world. And I think it's probably a little bit of both. So when it comes to specifically Russian interference in recent elections in Europe, I have only a few examples here for you. There are probably 20 more that I could have put on the slide. There have been active cyber, disruptive cyber attacks as well as espionage campaigns against a number or targeted at um, a number of different politicians from European countries during their elections in France, UK, Belgium, and Germany specifically. We have also very, very strategically timed strategic messaging campaigns, and General Potter earlier today told you that Russian disinformation and strategic messaging is so effective because it's also very tailored. And you can see from those four cases, three cases that I have listed here on this slide, that they're very focused on the particular context of the country in which they are being created. In Spain, the particular strat strategic messaging campaign involved the Basque military and separatist group. In Poland, we had information about a specific bogus bomb threat, and the Polish government is very, um, very concerned with the war in Ukraine. I just came back from Poland a few days ago, and I and there was a, a talk even by Polish president, the, the Polish president and a few other senior Polish officials. They're very worried that the war in Ukraine is going to spill over into Poland. It's an actual concern for them. And I think we, have, we cannot take that lightly. And then in Slovakia, there was an AI-generated audio recording of an actual um, politician running for elections there who supposedly was talking about rigging the election. So those were all based on the local context, and they all were very disturbing strategic messaging campaigns that probably had effects on the people that, that saw them. So how about Russian information warfare in the United States? Nina walked you through the Russian interference in the 2016 elections. And there was a hacking leak, info, a hacking leak operation that was very, um, it was a surprise to the US government and I do agree that it was effective. There were two Russian hacking groups that were both tripping over each other actually in the Democratic National Committee's networks, and they exfiltrated a lot of information about the Hillary Clinton campaign that they afterwards strategically released through WikiLeaks and Twitter to thousands, millions of Americans. We, or by we I mean the US government, started to learn about that campaign as soon as it happened because it was very obvious. But later, around the election and after the election, we also started learning about the other components of Russian information warfare during that period. And what was also very staggering was the troll farms that existed in Russia, in St. Petersburg. Basically, students and individuals like you and me were going to work from nine to five, and their job was to spread disinformation and incendiary messages on Twitter pretending to be Americans. And some of the campaigns that were generated through these groups, specifically on Facebook, reached over 130 million Americans. So we can argue all day about whether disinformation in that particular case had an effect on the US election and whether it was Russian disinformation and strategic messaging in general that got President Trump elected. The truth is, we don't know for certain, because there were so many other confounding factors, so many other pieces of information that the electorate was exposed to. But what we could say is that for sure, the Russian government took that as a victory, because they continued to repeat those tactics later. And today, from what we're seeing already in the media and um, from the indictments that we have, from the DOJ, the information we have from the US Treasury Department sanctions, is that the Russian government seems to be focused more on, try, on trying to influence our election through strategic messaging campaigns this time, and not so much through cyber operations. But we still have a month to go. I don't want to make a prediction and then be proven wrong, but it seems to me that we will see more of those influence operations going forward. And another specific type of operation that I want to highlight here, because I think we will see more of that type of activity, is cyber-enabled enabled influence operations. We have seen that already in a case earlier this year where the Russian government cooperated with a hacking group, and that hacking group supposedly was a hacktivist group that wasn't affiliated with the Russian government, but our cybersecurity companies proved very effectively that it was. 
that group hacked into, hacked into a water tank in Texas. There was only a temporary disruption, the water was fine, the, 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 the operation of the tank were, wasn't disrupted for long, uh, the local authorities managed it. But what the hacktivists did is they made a video of that attack and posted on Telegram. And that video was seen by a lot of people. So in doing that, they're amplifying the effect of an actual disruptive cyber operation. So they're intensifying the effects of that operation through the information space. And hence, they're, they're, the term for this type of activity is cyber-enabled influence operations. And I think we're gonna see more of those going forward. So in general, in, in addition to, to that la latest um, trend that I think we're gonna see more of, the Russian government is using a lot of non-state actors in its operations, especially against the West, and I think that'll continue. A main reason for that is also because Russia's more, the, Russia's most sophisticated hacker groups right now are focused on Ukraine. Since this is Russia's main priority to win the war, they're focused on identifying vulnerabilities in Ukraine's critical infrastructure, collecting information that is going to erode the will to fight of the Ukrainian people, and that's where their focus is. But through ransomware attacks, through hacktivists, through criminal actors that are based in Russia and are collaborating with the Russian government, the Russian government is still being very effective against, effective in targeting um, different cyber operations against the West. Cyber attacks with disruptive effects therefore will continue, especially ransomware attacks. And a trend that worries me um, a great deal is deep fakes. And we have a number of students here that I met today that are working on identifying deep fakes understanding their effects, and I think um, we're still in the early stages of how they will be developed, but we've already seen the Chinese government, the Russian government, the Indian government, over 16 governments around the world using AI and deep fakes, different forms of deep fakes to manipulate public opinion. And I think this is gonna be a trend that we'll have to monitor going forward and introduce effective policies to be able to contain the negative effects of deep fakes. So what can we do? We can do a lot. And I've listed here some of the technical specifications. First, I've looked at how can we mitigate the effects of cyber operations, and then how can we mitigate the effects of strategic messaging campaigns, which are the two types of operations that go hand in hand in Russia's information warfare playbook. And some of the technical solutions, the cyber, uh, cyber um, experts in the room will know, or the students, network visibility, network segmentation. Basically, know your assets. If you're an agency, whether you're a government agency or you're a private sector organization, know your assets, know where your crown jewels are, which are the critical assets of an organization that affect the functionality of a business. Make sure that they're protected. One of the ways to make sure that they're protected is by creating network segmentation in your, into your own networks, which means you have a perimeter that you're guarding for different um, cybersecurity tools. But then when you know where your crown jewels are, you put an internal perimeter around them and you segment the different networks inside your network so that not everyone has access to those, those crown jewels. And this is important because how do, cyber, uh, how do hackers go in? They usually go in for least privileged accounts, phishing emails, employee clicks on the link, gains access, the, the hacker gains access to the system. But then they try to move laterally in your system. And the more segmentation you have, the harder it is for hackers to move laterally and get to your crown jewels. So that's why this is important. Incident response playbooks, we heard today that here you do a lot of um, wargaming exercises and simulations. This is similar, just specifically focused on cyber incidents.